All right, guys. I hope you guys are all doing well. Um, I'm pretty sure that my wife's going to go out pretty soon for our baby, so I thought I'd start making videos. And this is going to be the first one that I try to hash out. It's a fairly long one, so I'm hoping to keep this video under 25 minutes. Uh, so I'm going to try to go. I'm going to give you guys sections that you guys are going to do on your own, and you'll stop. I'll give you guys a warning. Go ahead and please pause the video and do this and such. So please try to follow along as best you can. Uh, this section, we're talking about something called sequences. Sequences are where you get a term or a function that's like this. You plug in one, two, three, four, and you start to build a sequence. The sequence can go on forever. Uh, and that's where we're going to start running into our next sort of uh, idea. Um, so to start off with, we have a sequence. A sequence is a function whose domain is the positive integers. A sequence, a function whose domain is positive integers. First off, it says list the first four terms of the sequence. So what we're going to do is go ahead and substitute in one, two, three, and so on. And what you guys are going to see is we're going to get uh, three minus one plus right here. Um, and this is going to leave us with three minus one, which is going to leave us with uh, two. Okay. The next term in the sequence, we're going to have 3 plus negative 1 squared, which is going to leave us with 3 plus 1, which is 4. Our next term in the sequence, this was 1, this is 2, this is 3, and this is 4. Uh, we're going to have 3 plus negative 1 cubed. Uh, negative 1 cubed is going to leave us with negative 1, so we end up with 2 once again. And then we go on to the next part. We're going to have 3 plus negative 1 to the power of 4. Since it's even, we're going to be left with 3 plus 1, which leaves us with 4. So in the sequence, we go between 2 to 4 to 2 to 4. Okay, here are a few that I'd like you guys to do. Please go ahead and stop the video and do B and C for me. All right, part D here. This is called a recursive rule. What you have here is what you start with. And then each and every time, what you're going to do is follow this rule. So we're going to take our first term, which is 25. This is term 125. And then 2. What do we do? Our rule is each time we are going to subtract 5. So 25 minus 5, we get 20. 20 minus 5, we're going to get 15. 15 minus 5, we're going to get 10. So on and so forth. Okay, we're just writing out the first four terms for each of these. All right, now we're going to go on a little bit further. This is the idea of a limit of a sequence. Okay, first off, the limit of a sequence, a sub n, is L. It is written like this. The limit is n approaches infinity of a sub n is equal to L. And the big part here is if the limit exists... If the limit exists, then the sequence converges. What does this mean? It approaches a number. Okay. If the limit, the limit does not exist, this means we get D and E or we get a uh, infinity or a non-real solution, then the sequence will diverge. Okay. And this is going to play a major role in this entire section on series. This is just the start of it. Okay, so we're going to go through. This first one is going to be a little bit involved. This is one that we did in class uh, not too long ago, but we're going to go find the limit of the sequence. Okay, this limit is going to take us a little bit of time. What I first did is I wrote y equals the limit as n approaches infinity of this. Um, and what we always do is we start off by substituting in a value. So I'm going to do a little bit of scratch work off here to the side. If I substitute... Infinity, well, you can't necessarily substitute infinity. I'm going to end up getting 1 plus 0 because I'm going to have 1 over infinity to the power of infinity. Um, and that is an indeterminate form. Now, with an indeterminate form, I can do El Hapital's rule, but the issue with El Hapital's rule is I need to make my function have the form P of X over Q of X. If it's not divided by one another, I can't take the derivative of the numerator and the derivative of the denominator and then take the limit once again. So I have to get into that form. And what you guys might notice up here on the top is we have an exponent. This exponent needs to come down because I need it to be of the form P of X 
uh, divided by Q of X or else I can't perform L Hopital's rule. So what we did in class is we went through and we decided to take the LN of each side of this function. When you take the ln of this right-hand side, we're able to take the ln of this function. The limit part does not matter when we're working with this. Um, and we're going to go ahead and be able to bring down our n as a result. So we're going to have ln of y, and we'll bring that back up at the end, uh, is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of ln, or n, times ln of 1 plus 1 over n, okay? Now, if we take the limit here again, we're going to get infinity times ln of 0, and ln of 0, as you guys know, ln looks something like this. ln of 0, if you take the limit from the right, approaches negative infinity, we're going to have another issue. So what we have to do with this is we're going to try to rewrite it in another form. Um, and with this, what we're going to do is put n over 1. And just like when we divide two fractions, you multiply by the reciprocal, we're going to go the opposite way. We're going to take the reciprocal of n over 1 and divide by it. And we're going to be left with ln of y is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of ln of 1 plus 1 over n. I'm going to write it as n to the negative 1 power over 1 over n which is also n to the negative 1 power. And you guys are going to see in a minute why I wanted to do that. Okay, Now we're at the point where we're able to substitute these values in. If we plug in or substitute in infinity into this, we're going to get infinity uh, right here, 1 over infinity. That's n to the negative 1 power, which is 0. So we get ln of 1, which is 0, over uh, 1 over infinity, which is going to give us 0. 0 divided by 0 is indeterminate form. This so is going to end up getting a 0 over 0. So we're able to use L. Hopital's rule. L. Hopital's rule. Okay, so what we end up doing here is we're going to be left with ln of y equals the limit as n approaches infinity of u prime over u. u prime over u. So what's going to end up happening is we're going to get on top, we're going to get the derivative of this, n to the negative 1, which is going to leave us with uh, negative 1, n to the negative 2, over 1 plus n to the negative 1. That's u prime over u. And the numerator, we're going to get negative 1, n to the negative 2, over 1. Okay. Now, if you want to, we can go ahead and rewrite each of these, or we could put a 1 underneath our, um, our 1, negative 1, n to the negative 2, and we can just multiply by the reciprocal. I'm trying to take this the nicest way. I'm just going to multiply by the reciprocal of the denominator. We have two fractions. I want to clean things up. I don't really want to take another step to rewrite it. So let's go ahead and do this, and we're going to end up with negative 1, n, to the negative 2 power over 1 plus 1 over n, I'm going to rewrite that one, times the reciprocal of the denominator, which is going to be 1 over negative 1 n to the negative 2. And you guys are going to notice right here that we have two things that are in common in our numerator and in our denominator. And when we divide those, those are going to cancel, and we're going to be left with a limit that we actually can take. I'm going to add a little bit of room here so I don't go writing off to the side. And then let's go ahead and finish this one off, okay? So with this, we're going to have ln of y equals the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over 1 plus 1 over n. And what's super nice about this is we know that 1 over n, as n approaches infinity, when you divide 1 by a huge number that keeps going on, it approaches 0. So we end up getting ln of y equals 1 plus 1 or 1 over 1 plus 0. And uh, this is quite literally ln of y equals 1. And we can go through and use exponential base e on both sides. We're performing the inverse. Um, and we're able to go through and get y equals e. And because of this, since the limit... Um, approaches a number is equal to some value. Let's read exactly what it says. Uh, since the limit is equal to L, it converges. The sequence converges. Since the limit 
is equal to some number, equal to a number, the sequence converges. And that's it. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through, and some of these are going to be much nicer than others. Uh, here are a few properties. They always start out with it. Uh, if the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n is equal to L, and the limit as n approaches infinity of b sub n is equal to k, then if you have addition, you just add the two limits together. If you have a constant in front, you can pull the constant out, in and out of the limit. As long as it doesn't have a variable attached to it, you're able to just multiply the limit. So if the limit is, say, 5 and c is like 10, you take 10 times 5 and you can get 50. Um, if you take both of these limits and multiply, each of them apply the same way. The limit as a sub n approaches infinity is L. The limit as b sub n approaches infinity is k, so you get L times k. Same thing when you divide. Okay, what we're going to do is go through and we're going to find the limit for the first one. And then I'm going to let you guys go ahead and do part B on your own. This part right here is going to be a your turn. I'd like you guys to try this one out on your own right here. Let's go ahead and do this first one though. We're going to take and write out a few parts of the sequence. Um, what you guys are going to start to see is for something to converge, it has to get smaller over time. It can't get larger. If it gets larger, generally, it's going to not converge. Okay, so let's go ahead and write it out. Oh, this was one from the beginning. Remember, we started out, we got two, we got four, we got two, we got four. And if you look at that, this is not going to converge because we keep going back and forth between two and four. It's not actually approaching a number. We're going between two numbers. We're going between two numbers. Uh, between two and four and we just keep going back and forth and back and forth and it doesn't just approach one number okay what I'd like you guys to do is please go ahead and take the limit as n approaches infinity the limit as n approaches infinity of n over 1 minus 2n if it approaches a number the function is going to converge if it doesn't it does not converge it diverges I'm going to give you guys a moment to go ahead and do that All right, on to the next problem. This one is another one that's going to require L. Hopital's rule. Um, this one, however, has an A to the power of U. So we're going to have to take into consideration this when we do it. I wrote the rule up on the top. Uh, so we can actually leave this to you guys. What I'd like you guys to do is please go ahead and take the limit. The limit as N approaches infinity of n squared over 2 to the power of n minus 1. Um, what you guys are going to do is go ahead and uh, uh, take the limit as it approaches infinity. If you get indeterminate form, uh, you're going to perform L. Hopital's rule, and it should work out just fine. So I'm going to give you guys a moment to go ahead and finish that problem off. Go ahead and hit pause, finish the problem, then you guys come right back. All right. So here... We're moving on to this next topic, okay? This next topic is going to be one that you guys may see. Uh, essentially, what you guys are going to be using is something called the squeeze theorem. We've already seen the squeeze theorem before. You guys are going to see it again. This is the squeeze theorem for sequences. Um, essentially, how it works is if you have two functions, right, and you know that this function here is going to converge, and you know this function's going to converge as well, and you have a function that's somewhere in between this and it's bounded or is always smaller, what's going to end up happening is this is also going to converge if you know that it's smaller than it. So what do we have to do when we're trying to go through and prove something using the squeeze theorem? Essentially what we do is we take this top function right here, a sub n, we show it converges to l, we take this bottom function, b sub n, and we know that it also converges to L. Then there exists some value such that our function c of n is also going to converge to L because it's bounded by these, okay? And that's kind of the basic idea. I'm going to go through one of these with you guys. Um, we're going to have to work with something called 
Uh, factorials, you might not have seen this for a while, so this is just a little reminder. Uh, a factorial is n factorial, it looks like this. Uh, we know that zero factorial is equal to one's one of the rare ones. When you guys go back through the rest of these, if you have something like say five factorial, this is gonna be five times four times three times two times one. Um, and what you guys are gonna find in this section is n factorial grows faster than any other function. It grows faster than an exponential function. Um, it is one of the fastest growing things and it always overtakes an exponential. Um, so what we're gonna do is go and take a look at a problem. We're gonna use the squeeze theorem to prove this, this concept, okay? So what we have here is we have a sequence uh, where we have c sub n is equivalent to negative one to the power of n times one over n factorial, okay? Um, and so we have to show that it's converge, it converges and then we're gonna find its limit that goes along with it. Um, essentially, what we know is that uh, to apply this squeeze theorem, we need to show that two convergent sequences are related to C sub n. And so we're gonna take a couple of possibilities. We're gonna relate it to something that we know is gonna converge. We're gonna take two functions. We're gonna take A sub n equals negative one half to the power of n, negative one over two to the power of n. And then we're also gonna compare this to uh, the positive version of this, b, is, b sub n is equal to uh, one over two to the power of n, okay? What we know with this is that as we take these, n factorial, n factorial, as you go out is gonna be one times two times three times four times five times six, all the way out towards our nth term. As for two to the n, to the power of n, we're gonna have two times two times two times two times two. Um, and if we go out and take the first few terms, the first four terms, uh, one times two times three, we get six times four, we get 24 times five times six times seven, all the way out to n. Um, this right here is n minus four fac factors. Okay, and what you can see is it grows really fast. If we go to this next part and we take this all the way out towards n, well, it's still gonna be two at the end, um, we're gonna get the first four terms of 16 times two times two times two all the way out to our last term. This is also the first n minus four factors. What I'd like you guys to notice is if you look at these numbers, this number n factorial, it outperforms two to the power of n easily. It's much larger. Just by looking at the first four terms, it's larger. And as you keep going, we're gonna multiply by five, six, seven, eight, and we're gonna continue to multiply by two. So n factorial overtakes two to the power of n. Why is that important? Well, if you look up here, we're dividing by n factorial. It grows super fast, right? So we're gonna end up in a situation between these two functions where we have a decay, right? This is just a quick sketch of it. And we have this function here. This right here is one over two to the power of n. This is negative one over two to the power of n. And we know that when we divide through by this, it's gonna to continue to fall in between after the first couple of times that we substitute into it. It's gonna to start to look like this. And what's gonna end up happening is we know that this top function converges, we know this bottom function converges, and thus we know that the center function is gonna converge. And so using the rules and using the uh, structure up here, we're gonna show that it's bounded in between, the same kind of idea. Um, and so let's go ahead and do this. So we know that negative one over two to the n is smaller than, is less than or equal to negative one to the power of n over one over n factorial. And this is less than or equal to one over two to the n when n is greater than or equal to four. This is after the fourth term. 
Before it, it is smaller. Why? One times two times three is six. Two times two times two is eight. So after the fourth term, we know that the top function is going to grow much faster, and that's where this part is where we're going over the topmost function, okay? And we're also going to be below it over here as well, okay? So what we know because of the squeeze theorem, so by the, the squeeze theorem, we know that the limit as n approaches infinity of negative 1 to the power of n over 1 over n factorial, it's going to approach 0. Just as we looked out here, it's getting closer and closer to 0. It's bounded by these two things that we know approach 0 as we got towards infinity. And what we learned is n factorial grows faster than 2 to the n. To any exponential, it grows much faster. We might have to figure out how many factors that we go out, but over time, it will grow faster because these numbers are getting larger and the numbers in your exponential are always going to remain the same. Okay, that's kind of the basic idea. Here's our next part. This is the absolute value theorem. We know if the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n is equal to zero, then we know that the limit is also equal to zero. Okay. Um, here's a sequence that we're going to take a look at. We're going to determine if it converges or diverges. Okay, So we have 2 over 1, 4, 8, 16, uh, 32. This looks like 2 to the power of n in the numerator, right? This looks like 2 to the power of n. In the denominator, we're going to have 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. It looks like we're adding 2 each time, starting at 1. So we have n plus 2. We're going to keep adding that as we go. So what we do at this point is we're going to go through and we're going to take the limit as n approaches infinity and we're going to see what goes on with it. I think I got this okay. Let's see. Did I, did I get it right? Is it plus 2? If we start at 1, right, we'll plug in 1, we get 3. Oh, that's not what we want. We don't want to start at 3. We want to start at 1. When we plug in 1 here, we want to have 2 to the power of 1, 2, 2 to the power of 2, 4, 2 to the power of 3, 8. When we plug in 1, we have to get that. So I guess we want to add 2 each time, not 1 each time. So let's try out 2n. So this is 2. When we plug in 1, we want to go down to 1. It's 2n minus 1. Let's go ahead and see how this works. If I plug in 1, I get 1. If I plug in 2, I get 4 minus 1, which is 3. If I plug in 3, I get 6 minus 1, is 5. Okay, so we figured it out. So what we're going to do with this is we're going to go through and take the limit as n approaches infinity, and uh, we're going to see what happens. Okay. Um, as a result, uh, if we go through and direct substitute, we can't direct substitute with infinity. As we approach, though, uh, 2 to the power of n approaches infinity, uh, 2 times n approaches infinity, so we're going to get an indeterminate form. If we get an indeterminate form, we have to perform L. Hopital's rule. L. Hopital's rule. And what's going to end up happening is we're going to get the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n, which is 2 to the n times ln of 2. All over 2. Okay. And what we end up getting here now is 2 to the power of infinity which is going to approach infinity. So because of this, the sequence, what this implies is that the sequence diverges. Okay, let's go ahead and move on. Here's another one. This one's going to take a little bit more, uh, and I'm going to let you guys go ahead and think about it as we start to go through it. We're almost to the end of it. Um, we're switching off between negative... And positive so this means we're gonna have negative 1 to the power of n or negative 1 to the power of n plus 1 let's see if we start out negative it's to the power of n okay cool in the numerator um, we're gonna have 2 8 26 80 oh, okay this looks like it's 1 off of 9 this is 1 off of 3. This is 1 off of 27. This is 1 off of 81. This is 1 off of 243. 
So it looks like we're off of 3 to the power of n. Okay. How do we write that? Uh, 3 to the power of n. Okay. Uh, and we want to subtract 1. So 3 to the n minus 1. Okay, cool. <laughs> I'm glad we got that one. Uh, if we look at the next part, however, we're going to start seeing we get 1 times 2, times 6, times 24. Oh, okay, okay. Um, if you remember what we just did up here, I'm starting to see it. Uh, 1 times 2 is 2. 1 times 2 times 3 is 6. 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 is 24. That's n factorial in the denominator. So this is all over n factorial. Okay. All right. Now, what we're going to be doing with this is we're going to go through and uh, we're going to take the absolute value of this. We're going to use the same idea that we did up above that we're going to use what's called the absolute value theorem. So we're going to take the absolute value of it and see if it approaches zero. Okay. So um, we're going to go through and take the absolute value, the limit of the, as n approaches infinity of the absolute value of negative one to the n times three to the n minus one over n factorial. Okay. Uh, when we do this, this negative is going to go away. And so we're going to be left with the limit as n approaches infinity of 3 to the n minus 1 over n factorial. All right. Just like on our prior test, guys, we have to think about which one of these grows faster because we're going to have to take El Hopital's rule over and over and over and over and over again. Uh, we also don't know the derivative of n factorial off the top of our head at this point. So let's think. If I go through and do this, we learned in the last section from the squeeze theorem that n factorial will outgrow anything, right? Any exponential. So we know that the bottom's going to grow faster. So if the bottom grows faster as we head towards infinity, it's going to approach zero. Okay? And because of this, since the limit as n approaches infinity, we're going to call this a sub n of a sub n approaches zero. Then what we know is the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n, not the absolute value of a sub n, is also equal to zero. And that's by the absolute value theorem. By the absolute value theorem. I wonder if you guys can hear my dog snoring in the background. <laughs> All right. We're almost done, guys. This is the last part of it. Um, first part says a sequence is monotonic if the terms are always increasing, always decreasing, or constant. I'm going to let you guys go ahead and plug in 1, plug in 2, plug in 3, plug in 4, and then see if the numbers are always getting larger. If they aren't, then it's not monotonic. So please go ahead and take a moment. Go ahead and complete all of these. I'm sorry, this is taking longer than I thought. I thought we'd get through it quite fast. All right, and this is a uh, second to last slide. I know it says 16, we have one last one. So this is the definition of a bounded sequence. The sequence is bounded above if there exists a number m such that a sub n is less than or equal to m for all, for all, n, okay, that's called an upper bound. The next part, a sequence is bounded below if there exists a number n such that n is greater than a sub n for all n, okay? And then a sequence is bounded if it is bounded above and below, okay? This is the definition of bounding, okay? If your function is always smaller than some number, okay? All right, and here's the theorem that goes along with it. If a sequence is bounded and monotonic, then it converges, okay? So first off is a pretty, it's a good one. It's a good one to look at. This, we're talking about a sequence here. We're not talking about a series. We're talking about a sequence. We're not adding all the pieces. We're just looking at it. Uh, for this, we have one over n. Um, if you plug in one, we get one over one, one over two, one over three, one over four. So it's monotonic, monotonic decreasing. 
okay? Now, if we think about it, is it also bounded? Well, the largest number that it's gonna have is gonna be one, right? And then what's gonna end up happening is it's gonna continue to increase or decrease. Is it ever gonna become negative? No, so it's also bounded by zero. It's bounded by zero and one. So it's monotonic decreasing. It's bounded by one and zero. I guess I should write y equals. So therefore the sequence converges. What this implies is that the sequence converges. What I'd like you guys to do is please go ahead and take a moment, do B and C, and then we're done with this lesson. Hope you guys have a wonderful day. Talk to you guys later.